welcome to Face to Face on City TV. My guest today is a former student leader who rose to become perhaps the youngest minister we have had in this country in the Fourth Republic. He served as a deputy minister and these days he associates as a member of parliament, albeit a very high-ranking one. The Honorable Samuel Okujoto Ablakwa, member of parliament for North Tong, is our guest on Face to Face. Honorable, hello and welcome to the program. Thank you, Kojo. Good to see you. Well, it's, it's a pleasure having you on the show. And I, I, I was going through a couple of articles you wrote back in the day when we called you Son of Man. Oh, you have copies. <laughs> Where did the name come from? Why did you feel the need to enter student activism under a pseudonym? <laughs> well, that takes us way back. Uh, the name Son of Man was given to me way back in Presec uh, by my... SU colleagues, mm. uh, people don't know that side of me, that I was vice president of the scripture union, I used to preach the gospel, I was an evangelist, you know the Presec SU vice presidency is reserved for the head of the evangelical team, mm. so when you become vice president, you are in charge of all evangelism, and uh, uh, typical of me, I don't do anything um, look warmly. I go all out. So uh, you would find me preaching in the buses, preaching at lorry stations, and uh, uh, I say that these days I'm probably on sabbatical, but I still have the calling and I shall return one day. The prophets are awaiting you. I believe strongly. Um, so uh, those days uh, I did not lock my chop box. It was always opened. And my mom, as the first boy, will visit me every week, break all the visiting rules. And uh, so I always had, you know, store of food. So when we get into that time of the time where, you know, students are broke and uh, chop boxes have run dry, I have uh, quite a, a good uh, store of provisions. And uh, uh, because I didn't lock it and everybody would troop in. So they said, oh, I'm the son of man. I always seek and save. And I thought that it was an interesting name to adopt as pen name. So I began writing in Presec. I was very active in Presec. Beyond being the SU vice president, I was also president of, a, of the Civic Education Club. And I used to write under that pen name. I also was the trustee of the Greater Accra Student Representative Council. So that's where my student leadership, you know, days began. That's where I cut my teeth. And um, as trustee, you were in charge of all 41 secondary schools. And we went for a congress at Accra Academy. I stood with other students, I think we were about seven, and won a competitive election. And that was the first time I contested. And since then, uh, interestingly, it's been 20 years, uh, now, because uh, I was uh, August 1998. Mm. That's when I was elected trustee of the SRC. So fast forward, I entered the University of Ghana and uh, first week I started writing. I was not happy with the turn of events at the matriculation and that was my first article. I recall taking the vice chancellor on and a lot of uh, even seniors were saying that who is this first year guy who uh, it's showing so much courage and bravado and it's not intimidated, it's not even scared about possible victimization. And interestingly, my articles caught the attention of the SRC executive at the time, mm. uh, led by Peter Nana Siedu, the SRC president. So they wrote to me and said they wanted me to be the press secretary of the SRC because they need somebody who can write well and articulate. And when you become press secretary of the SRC, you per the SRC constitution, you are expected to be the editor in chief of the SRC magazine uh, known as The Forum. So I edited that magazine. It had not been produced in a long time until my time as press secretary. We managed to produce it. I later on became editor in chief of The Echo as well, the Commonwealth Hall magazine. So that's why I am a strong vandal. I believe in the uh, principles of vandalism and. Uh, uh, the ethos and what it represents. Um, so I continued with activism internally and I started attending um, central committee meetings of the National Union of Ghana students. Uh, during the debates on the floor and all of that, my peers thought that, you know, I had good ideas. I articulated, you know, the views of students, what uh, my position 
was on issues resonated with them and that I should put myself forward for the NUCS presidency. So mm -hmm. that is how come many of my colleagues had thought that because I was very active within the SRC, I will run for SRC president. But um, I opted for a bigger challenge. I was elected president of the National Union of Ghana Students, a union that I hold in very, very high regard. Um, started as a National Union of Gold Coast Students, has such you know, great former presidents as uh, Hakuman Oswajeman, uh, Atta Kennedy, Dr. Mane Buama, Harun Idrisu, um, Amin Anta, um, uh, Damboche, uh, who was uh, NUC secretary, and, and others. And these are activists who you cannot write the history of our country, the democracy we enjoy today, without them. I mean, I always say that even what some of us suffered, uh, I got uh, my uh, degree uh, withheld for two years. Um, that is a smaller price to pay, I always tell people. Um, so I don't carry any grudge at all. Um, I expected even worse. I mean, there are people like Kakraba Cromwell who could not uh, graduate, uh, they were rusticated, they were victimized, and they had to uh, actually use uh, unapproved channels to uh, run out of the country because the regime at the time was after them. So it's a union that I hold in very high esteem and I believe that they have made tremendous contributions. You have to trace the history of NUCS even all the way to the West Africa Students Union mm -hmm. that had the likes of uh, Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. They had their first meeting in Paris, France, the second meeting in London, the United Kingdom, and uh, pushing for independence of of, 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 of African countries. And that is what led to the creation of member unions. So uh, n n the National Union of Gold Coast Students at the time emerged from a resolution from the West Africa Students Union at the famous London conference. So you cannot tell the history of the African struggle, African independence, uh, the fight over colonialism and the eventual victory over colonialism without nooks. People forget that NUCS was part of the Consultative Assembly that wrote the 1992 Constitution. People forget that the National Service Scheme was an idea of NUCS. We put it forward. Many people forget that. And many other initiatives which um, have come to stay and have helped us. So, Honorable, this leads me to what is happening at the Kwame Kuma Industrial Science and Technology. Let's take your opinion first as a student leader and then as a political leader. What is your opinion on the situation there? My opinion uh, from the perspective of a uh, former student leader is that the students uh, have not been listened to, the students' rights have been trampled upon. If you hear some of the accounts of the student leaders, um, the fact that they no longer have liberty to even assemble, um, you have a situation at Katanga and uh, Conti where the JC executive were removed by authorities. Can you imagine? Not impeached by those who elected them, but by the authorities, just because they opposed the policy of uh, converting their halls to mixed halls, and they have given the management of the JCS to first years. First years have just arrived. I mean, few weeks on campus, and you make them JC executive. How do you expect them to have the legitimacy to operate? How would the seniors relate to them? And then uh, what we are hearing from the student leaders about a prison, a cell, which is being kept by campus security. And the SRC president tells us that every week he has to go bailing out students. I mean, you wonder, even in uh, primary school, this doesn't happen. So things have clearly been festering and escalating, and you've had a situation where the rights of the students clearly under Article 21 of our constitution has been violated. And when they demonstrated which is legitimate. I mean, we are all seated here, we've took, taken part or organized led demonstrations. Our president of the Republic was one time known as the demonstrator in chief, Kumi Prekun, CME Prekun, and all the Prekuns. It's all part of our democracy. When you feel strongly about something, you protest, you stand up to be counted. Why did they have to be brutalized the way they were brutalized? And I saw the footage you know, broken skulls, blood all over, just because of a lawful protest. They were not destroying anything. So that led to the second protest. The first protest was on a Friday. The second protest was on a Monday. And by that time, they felt they had had it. Nobody was listening to them. The brutalities 
was just getting worse. And so they decided to take the law into their own hands. That is the part that I depart from them. That is not justifiable. I still believe that they have some good amount of public support, but uh, because of the Monday violent demonstration, which some of them have said, by the way, that they suspect they had infiltrators from town who um, must have masterminded. But, but still, I mean, yeah, I agree with you that you are leading the demonstration. You take responsibility. In our days, when we were leading demonstration, what we used to do is that you identify at least 50 people, your internal security arrangements, because... You can always have agent provocateurs who will come in and then mar the demonstration. They can even attack you. They can uh, uh, create problems for you, which you then have to uh, be made liable for. I mean, if you are conversant with university history, the last time the University of Ghana witnessed something like this, uh, where vehicles were burnt and properties destroyed, was in 1980, 1982. Um, the university was then closed for almost two years. By the time the university was reopened in 1984 and the damages were assessed, it came to some 10.6 million cities, $4 million at the time. And Ghana had to be called upon to pay citizens. This time, we do not know the extent of damage. We do not know how much will be involved and who is going to pay for it. But this is avoidable. So, um, from the point of uh, view of a student leader, this could have been resolved by our uh, officialdom, and here I refer to government and university authorities, creating the avenue to listen. Because of this background I have as a former student leader, what I did when I became minister, deputy minister in charge of tertiary education was to institute mechanisms for constant engagement. So every Wednesday, for example, every Wednesday 2 to 4, student leaders had an automatic walk-in. Insofar as I'm in the country, you can just come and see me, whatever the issues are. That's one. Two, at the beginning of every academic year, we called all student leaders in what we described as the student summit, the annual student summit. So it's opened by my boss, Professor Nana Jenopoko Ajiman, and we hear out the student leaders to tell us whatever their concerns are, their issues for the academic year, what their uh, major um, uh, point of view is on various matters. And then we take them on board. So that's proactive leadership. So that's two. Three, we instituted a program we called Campus Connect, where we then took it upon ourselves to visit the campuses. I tell you sometimes it, it wasn't easy. I recall at the Kumasi College of Education, um, we did not receive a, a, a warm welcome. Um, uh, that's when the allowances had been uh, converted to student loans and the teacher trainees were not happy. They gave us a very hostile welcome. Some even uh, uh, pelted uh, sachet water at us and all of that. But uh, we considered it hazards of the job and uh, left the campus, continued to another campus. We did all of this, suffered all of this, sacrificed so that we knew that the cost of not listening to students and student leaders is more dangerous. You know, if the student leaders had been heard, if the alumni had been heard, remember that they even had to petition His Excellency the President. Remember that as all of this agitation was going, going on, the ministers of education on July 15th, 2018, at the 52nd congregation of KNUST, the minister of education, Honorable Matthew Poku Prempe, went to the congregation and endorsed the policy. I would have thought that he would have held on, listened to all sides before. He himself is an alumni of Unity Hall. He should listen to his peers, listen to the student leaders before taking sides. He endorsed the policy and urge Unity Hall to, you know, change course. Then on September 8th, two months after that, on sep two months after the minister himself went to endorse it, September 8th, the minister of state in charge of tertiary education, Professor Kwesi Yanka, visited KNUSC and said he had come there to commend the vice chancellor for the bold decision to implement this conversion policy and that he 
urges other universities to emulate that example. Once again, I thought that arriving on campus as Minister of State in charge of tertiary education, you have been dean of students before. When I was NUC's president, I used to interact with him closely as pro vice chancellor of the University of Ghana. I would have thought that with all this you know, experience and understanding of student leaders as key stakeholders, it is not for nothing that the establishment acts of the various universities makes SRC president, Grassack president, members of council. If in the wisdom of parliament, students' leaders, their views are not important, they will not be sitting on council, sitting on academic boards, sitting on all kinds of university committees. I was the first student leader to sit on the disciplinary committee of the University of Ghana Disciplinary Committee. So we have made a lot of progress in terms of creating space for student leaders to be part of the university structure. But it's also and so, and so, yes, uh, yes, it, it does, and I'll come to that. So it was improper for the Minister of State in charge of tertiary education, in my candid view, to arrive, see only the Vice Chancellor, endorse the policy, and leave. It is all of these things that have culminated in the crisis we have, where the alumni felt that they have been treated with contempt, the student leaders feel that they don't want to be heard, and it is unfortunate. So from the point of view of a minister, I believe that part of my uh, answers will apply to what I thought the ministers could do. Instead of the rushed endorsement, uh, and now you see a situation where they are stepping out of it and blaming only one person, the vice chancellor. And logically, I say that if the vice chancellor is to be blamed for this policy and its implementation challenges, you must also be blamed. Elsewhere, you will be the first to even resign. People resign over a train <laughs> driver who... Uh, is reckless and, 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 and there's an accident. A transport minister will resign elsewhere where min the principle of ministerial responsibility is very high. In the United Kingdom recently, uh, when the foreign secretary could not live with the so-called Czechos plan under the Brexit policy, he resigned as a matter of principle. So if there is a policy you don't agree with, you resign. If there is a policy which has been implemented wrongly and you want to blame the vice chancellor for it, you must also take responsibility. So to avoid all of this, so we don't get to where we are now, there should have been proactive leadership, a leadership of broad-based consultation and engagement. And that is what we are seeing lacking, even in the resolution of this matter, the hurried dissolution of the University Council. We had cause to once dissolve a council. That is the WA Polytechnic Council. How did we go about it? It was not government directly doing it because we don't have the mandate legally. So we asked the, university, the National Council for Tertiary Education as Article 70 of the Constitution and Act 454, the NCT Act 1993. They are the body that insulates the universities from governmental control. And it's for good reason, because of the principles of academic freedom, of autonomy, the independence of our universities. And the NCT looked into the matter, had a committee investigated and all of that. Then the committee recommended that the council should be dissolved. That's what was done. But in this case, you saw the Ministry of Education putting out a statement dissolving the council. So. Well, let me give you an update on this, and then perhaps you can mm -hmm. move it into your answer. Now, from what the government is saying, and this is a statement that just came through, and as part of the reasons for the dissolution of the council, the government says that the council was dissolved because government holds it ultimately responsible for the failure of the failure of adequately managing internal affairs of the university, leading to a breakdown of law and order. The interim measures were necessary to protect lives and property. That's what government says. You see, I disagree with government. There are two things that government has done. The first one, we all don't take issue with government. And that is the assessment of the security situation, working with the Regional Security Council to close down the university and impose 
a curfew. So that's the first dealing with the security issues because let's face it, the president is a commander in chief. But then to take the second stage, move a second step to then dissolve council. And then when you listen to Dr. Educhum, the deputy minister, he says the entire management council will determine the fate of the vice chancellor. Abba, somebody you don't appoint. You only send reps to the council and government has four reps. If you are not happy with your reps, you can replace them. But to dissolve the entire council, then to make matters worse, you go and announce an interim management council that has four members of the same council that you are criticizing. So this new statement that says that you dissolve the council because you are not happy with how they handle internal matters. Is it just the vice chancellor that you are targeting? Because the SRC president is part of council, the pro vice chancellor is part of council, and two others who are in this interim management council. You couldn't get even... Uh, neutrals, people who are not involved, removed. When you do things this way, coupled with the statements that your youth organizer had made, Nana Boache, in the immediate aftermath, that the vice chancellor will be history, and all of that, people are beginning to then read political machinations, especially coming from what has happened at the University of Education, Winneba, what has happened at GIJ, what has happened at Cape Coast. Polytechnic. These are very different you see, a, a, pattern, a pattern is emerging where, where people feel that, you know, the government is after heads of these institutions in flagrant violations of the principles of autonomy. But so, the Koma University situation mm -hmm. is clearly very different from what happened with the UEW, for instance, Vice Chancellor, who was replaced, and the GIG Rector, who was also replaced. This is clearly very different. It, 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 in my view, it is not. It is all about invading the autonomy of our institutions. It's all about the intrusion, unbridled intrusion. Let university councils act. Government should stay away. That is the principle. So, in my view, honestly, government bundled this whole matter. Government has, government has worsened the crisis. I'm not happy at all because it sets a very bad precedent where any agitation, we are not happy with maybe a vice chancellor, uh, then uh, the, the council is dissolved. And council is dissolved without NCT. I mean, read the constitution, read the preamble of Act 454. It's to insulate the institutions. In the history of higher education in Ghana, are you aware that presidents were chancellors? It had to take a struggle, a fight, that no, separates our institution from the politics. Because very soon, then the president who is the chancellor who want to be interested in NDC lecturers, the kind of research that should be conducted, the kind of grades that should be awarded. So if somebody like me goes back to school under uh, 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 President Akufuado Chancellor who wants to then meddle in academic matters, you can just imagine how untidy it will be. Messy. So presidents remove themselves. Osaji Fukuhama Kwan was the last chancellor of a university. And we said we were appoint chancellors who are not politicians, who are away from, you know, the ruling party, so that we can have independent institutions, so that academic freedom will be protected. It is for good reason. That is why I am in total solidarity with the unions, UTAG, GAWA, FUSAG, TEU, VCG. They have a case. Because if this precedent is allowed, I mean, you never know with tyrant, will take advantage of it. And all he has to do is to cite this precedent. So my appeal to the government is that they should not be intransigent. Uh, many analysts who have assessed the matter, lawyers and all of that who have looked at it, have said that, look, you got it wrong. Uh, and if uh, you want an investigation and you want people punished, the council can set up an independent committee. NCT can set up an independent committee. But let us not perpetuate the wrong. There have been too many illegalities in this whole saga, which has to end. We cannot continue this way. And, and, and that will be my, my honest view. We are escalating this matter by our intransigence. Already, all UTAC members are meeting across the country. There is a genuine threat that other universities will be shut down. That's not what we want. At the time I was leaving the tertiary department, we had over 7,000 foreign students from more than 60 different countries. Ghana has become 
the higher education hub in West Africa. Elsewhere, in Anglophone West Africa, you start a four-year program, it becomes six years, seven years. You are not sure when you even complete. The quality cannot be vouched for. And the certification, you know, is terrible. Ghana has such a reputation, great reputation. And so we are attracting international grants. Before I left, we had secured the World Bank Centers uh, for Excellence. And KNUSC was a beneficiary receiving good money for research. And the clause, if you read all these agreements, stability, stability. And you feel it's being lost? We are losing all of this okay. by the continuous intransigence of government. All right. We are speaking to the Member of Parliament for North John, the Honorable Samuel Okuyotabla. And we've delved into his part of the student again, what his opinion is on the current situation at the Planning for University of Science and Technology. When we come back from our break, we are going to be discussing hardcore politics and his days when he was labeled as a baby with sharp teeth. Wherever the weekend sporting action happened, we will bring it to you here on Scorecard. Every goal, every dunk, every punch, the winning strides, and the winning volleys. Come international media, he said, look, wait, sit and wait. Let me have a meal with my people. <laughs> and I think that that's the same cool, it's the same organization he brings to the field every time I've seen him play. He looks to me like somebody who has played over 50 cups already. Okay. But this guy, He's barely played over 25 cups for the national team. All of the weekend's action in one place. Scorecard, every Sunday at 8 p.m. prompt on CTTV. Welcome back to Face to Face, where I'm speaking with the Honorable, let's, we are done with the student issues. Let's talk about politics. You jumped in very young, but you were MPP, were you not? No, I've, I've never been MPP. In your student politics days, what were you? In my student politi politics days, I was apolitical, as the NUCS constitution. Was that possible at the time? Uh, very possible. Um, you know that um, the NUCS constitution is very clear, that if you are a Cadbury member of... A political party, you cannot run. Nux is an apolitical organization. And there are also those who say I was backed by the NDC. What I do know is that at the Congress, it was clear who, who the MPP candidate was. Remember that at the time, I had already written my first book, A State of Coma. I had argued that university students of my era were too docile, too timid, and we had allowed so many things. Uh, remember that when there was this big examination leakage scandal uh, under Professor Sensuachi, the SRC will not batch, NUCS will not take action. Meanwhile, the credibility of our certificates were at stake. I had to form the concerned students of Lagos. I couldn't wait for official though. Though I was press secretary of the SRC, I saw the SRC was not acting. I organized this concerned students of Lagos, called the likes of Ernesto Yeboah, Lord Hammer, Abdul Karim and uh, Nia Yikomi and others to come on board. And we led agitations that led to reforms. An investigation was conducted. Eventually, the vice chancellor was asked to step aside. These are achievements that I have, you know, and at the time I was already in achieving some national prominence and uh, had appeared on Good Evening Ghana, a major shows so so were, so so the political parties were, were being, looking at you uh, but with they were looking at me but also with a lot of caution that this is not somebody who will be malleable who will be a tool in well, our you hands you know oh yeah you are you are always approached yeah i i would i would not be honest before my god if i say i was not approached so what, uh but 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 i decided i decided that i will be neutral and true to conscience i was neutral contested and that's why I won. I believe that's why I won. Because, yes, people heard who the MPP and those candidates is, who the NDC and those candidates is. And students, as always, discerning as they are decided to go for a neutral who can champion their cause. And you notice that right from my inaugural address, it made the front pages of the Chronicle and other newspapers, where I argued that, look, the day of students, you know, docility and, and uh, student uh, being in bed with authorities, political parties is over 
that you guys get ready, wake up. A new neutral is on board. It was a very, very, very fiery speech. And people were scared. I remember getting calls even from the National Security Coordinator at the time. The Honorable Francis Poku that said, hey, young man, what are you threatening? And all of that. You know, you, you better be careful. Yes, I, 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 yes, because he became a father figure more or less. He would always call me and say, oh, please. He tried to, you know, guide me to tone down and all of that. So I did my work as NUC's president uh, to the best of my ability. When I finished, I decided that ideologically, um, I left leaning policies appeal to me. I had been influenced by the likes of uh, Ernesto Che Guevara, Fans Fanon, uh, I, I read The Wretched of the Earth, and um, I was greatly motivated. I used to, I subscribed to Fidel Castro's weekly letters, and I used to get them every week. And I was really, really inspired by those iconic left-wing figures of, of the modern era, and decided, uh, also certainly influenced by Kwame Nkrumah, I have all his compilations, all his books, and all his speeches. I would love to let you see them, see my library. I have quite an impressive library. You, you would love to see my collection. And so I decided that I will, I will do left-wing politics. And the NDC was the best alternative. CPP at the time did not show any positive signs that we could. Because at the end of the day, you need power to be able to implement your left-wing policies. And that is why I opted for the NDC. But through the CJA, I joined the Committee for Joint Action. Then later on, uh, Professor Mills invited me to help him with his youth organization. And uh, that's, that, that brought did, me did, where did, I am. Did you expect to rise as quickly as you did? And there are also those who say that because you were so young, you felt the need to make an impression. And the only way you could make an impression was being abrasive. Do you agree with that? Well, um, coming in young, that's true. Um, I think that in the Fourth Republic, I don't recall anybody who was appointed deputy minister at the age of 28. Uh, so um, it's a record that um, I must hold dear and cherish. Uh, but certainly that comes with its own challenges. So you are uh, relatively inexperienced and you can easily be brushed aside and some people, especially in a conservative society like Ghana where it is believed that when adults are speaking children must not be heard at all, you know it was a very challenging task uh, and I must say that it was not an appointment I expected uh, I remember that once again the cross you carry for being a student leader I uh, gained admission to the law faculty uh, two years after I left Legon, only to be told after I had passed my examination, passed the interview, my name was on the notice board. So we were asked to come for our admission letters. I go to the law faculty. They said, your letter is not here after they searched. So go to the registry. I went to the registry and then they tell me that, you know, we had been looking for you when you were student leader. You led a protest in the Lord Hammer elections and some properties were destroyed. You didn't want us to interfere with the SRC elections, which is a principle I, I, I still hold, um, that let the student leaders choose their leaders. Don't interfere. So I paid the price. Um, I took the university to court. It became quite a national uh, issue. Then Professor Mills heard about it and called me that, look, you can't fight the university. They decide who they want to admit. So you forget about it. Uh, when we win, I would... But you can always get a scholarship to go outside. So honestly, that's all I expected. That mm. having been blocked to enter the law faculty, uh, when we win, I'll get a government scholarship uh, as a poor activist, and then I can go and pursue my legal studies. I did not expect. So truth of the matter is that I initially turned down the offer. I pleaded that I didn't think that I could handle it. I had never thought that at 28 you know, you'll be a deputy minister for information. I turned it down initially, but my godfathers called me, Uncle Atu Ahoy, Totobi Kwachi, uh, Kwame Pepra, and advised me that you don't turn down the president. We will guide you. We are all here. You're only a deputy minister. You work under a minister, and that you can be assisted. You will make an impression. Remember that some of us in the PNDC era were even younger. Some were 25, 24, 26, and we were able to hold our own. So... 
you can you can make it so that's the story of me eventually accepting to uh, serve as deputy minister yes at the time people say that i was uh, abrasive um, i would not um, uh, question anybody's assessment and judgment of me at the time remember that those were very heady days for the first time in this country's history you had a sitting president being challenged it's never happened president rollins in face that challenge president kufu President Mahama, President Akufuado, so far does not have a challenger within his party. The tradition all over the world, including Ghana, has been that if you are an internal, uh, as, as president, you don't face internal uh, resistance. Uh, so we had the Fonka game, and it was during that period, as I forcefully, because you see, when your opponent is criticizing you and your leader, your president, everybody expects that that's what they will do. But if, when it's coming from within, it takes a different tone and uh, it, it can gain currency. It can be believed more uh, because they say that if uh, the frog comes to tell you that the crocodile is dead in the river, you better believe it because the frog just came from there. So I had to be quite forceful. And Professor Mills was somebody who would also not speak back. He would, he would just be reserved and keep quiet and watch everything. But he expects that his team and he'll call me, Sami, please. I haven't done what they are saying. You people should uh, strongly uh, protest. So I will then go out and defend Professor Mills and defend the administration. And that is a man that I can tell you up to now. I mean, I've never seen any human being like that. His love for country, his integrity. He doesn't want anything. They are traveling per diem. He says he doesn't want it. What is that? You know, and he always tell you, the young man, look, we are building this country for you. I didn't know whether he knew that he would be called soon, you know. But he always, he, he, he left such an impression on me that I would never, never forget that man. No wonder I named my son after him. And I hope that he'll grow up to be like a good old prof. So I was so emotionally attached to prof. And I knew him, the kind of integrity he has. He's, he, he, he's a... Uh, high sense of morality, a good man, God-fearing man. He won't do all the things they are saying he does. So that is what really propelled me to fiercely resist those attacks. You're resisting them from the man mm -hmm. whose principles mm -hmm. and ideologies have so convinced you, have so enamored you, mm -hmm. that just two years previously, you had decided that this is the party I want to join. Yeah. It wasn't because of Mills, it was because Jerry Rawlings had built a party in his image, in his yeah. ideology, yes. that you loved. Yes. And he's the one who labeled you as a baby with sharp teeth. Yes. So and you were fiercely resisting him. Yes. His family. <laughs> yes, you see, uh, at the time, and I still do believe now, that President Rawlings was clouded by the ambition of his wife to unseat President Mills. And so the analysis was not that objective. Um, they could not, you know, remove the interest, the agenda to unseat Professor Mills from really what was happening. And I think that on a lot of the issues they raised, they either had been misled or they were not briefed uh, thoroughly and it was my duty and I did it with all due respect that as deputy minister it's my duty honestly if I was appointed as deputy minister to works and housing or to sports youth and sports or to agriculture or roads what is my business in setting the record street but I had a mandate people forget the portfolio I held it was our duty as the spokesperson, the linguist of our boss, to defend him. And, 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 uh, and I did that to the best of my ability. Um, yes, if today, with my hindsight, with the experience, I've been in this public office now for about 10 years now, um, uh, I would not take out the fact that uh, perhaps I could have been um, maybe uh, a bit different with the approach. Yes, I'll speak forcefully. I'll put out the arguments to the best of my ability and articulate them with, you know, a lot of uh, 
sincerity. But I will not use coarse language or uh, insult or anybody. Anytime people say, oh, you, they were the babies with sharp teeth insult, I ask them, please, just produce, we are in the digital era, just produce one, <laughs> you know, um, archival story of me calling Nana Kunedu Ajima Rollins' names or His Excellency former President Rollins' names. I, I don't do that. You know, I always respect the fact that these are elders, these are the founders of our party. And in any case, my mother is always listening to me. She's my number one critic. And she brought me up in a way to be respectful, to be a Christian gentleman. That's why I was sent to Presec for Presbyterian training. So I'm not one to use insults and to be disrespectful of adults. Uh, but I do understand that at the time, uh, President Rawlings felt that the young men who were doing the pushback, engaging the Fonka members, probably he did not uh, like us very much at the time, um, decided to call us babies with sharp teeth. Um, he didn't mention names, but uh, I think that uh, over the period that... Uh, name became associated uh, with me. Um, I, I accept it. Um, what I'm happy though is that um, we do get on well now uh, with Chairman Rollins. Yes, um, I, I do meet him. Um, he invited me a couple of times um, uh, to discuss one or two issues uh, that are of concern to him. Um, I think that we can do more as a party to manage our internal differences. And all those, you know, internal contestations which played out in such an unhealthy manner affected us, affected us. Some of the names that people use, some of the things that people use against us, it has always come from within. These babies with sharp teeth, which the, our opponents took up and will always use it against us, seeking to damage the messenger so that the message, no matter how good, will not be accepted, came from within. I remember the friends and family attack on John Mahama came from within. So we need to be careful. One thing I noticed about the MPP is that in terms of internal party discipline, they have it more. They will not even allow you to go far. They will look at what they did to Afoko, Kovna Jepo and others. They will, they will bring down the disciplinary hammer and hit it hard. I think that moving forward, the NDC has to learn how to manage our internal differences so that it doesn't degenerate, uh, which is then used against us. Then later we come back trying to defend and all of that, and then it doesn't, it doesn't help very much. But I'm, I'm, as I'm, I'm one who always, always uh, wants to be at peace with all people, and I'm willing every day if there's anybody who in the course of my work felt that probably responded to the person too harshly or did not like, especially once I was very young at the time, I, I don't hesitate at all or I don't find it difficult to, um, you know, ask uh, that I be forgiven. It's, it's all, they are all hazards of the job. I always believe in being courteous and being respectful and making sure that we can work together as a team to build our country. At the end of the day, it's really about building our country. That is how we come into leadership. And as a member of parliament for North Tongue, they will tell you that I'm the best MP they've ever had. I'm not blowing my horn, but it's all because of my conceptualization of leadership and how I believe that leadership should impact positively. You should always leave a mark and that you have not just come for a position for yourself, to benefit yourself and your family and to ignore the people. And that is why the people have nicknamed me Togbi Wagbeji. The chiefs and people call me Togbi Wagbeji to wit the chief who fulfills his words, who lives according to his words. Because very happy, very happy with me, all the promises I made to not them. Of not at all. Not Anybody at all. Not are, at all. Uh, anybody can come. I want to use your medium to invite him a challenge. Not at all. Your I mean, origin <laughs> primaries have a history of being very, very, very dangerous. Absolutely. And I have uh, never had uh, an unopposed primaries. The first time I went in, we were seven. The second time, we were four, I think. So there's, I've always had a uh, competition. But Tobi Wagbeji is confident. Tobi Wagbeji always delivers. And I believe that... Uh, it is to the credit of the Almighty and uh, to the people who helped me deliver. Because God knows my heart that I really want to leave a mark and I want to help genuinely, help the community. 
Before I became MP, they kept saying that, look, you people come, and because we are World Bank, when you win the primaries, you know you're already in parliament, and you'll be there for four years anyway. So you just take us for granted. But I believe that a good name is always better than just a position. Will the good name in 15 years lead to a run at the presidency, perhaps? <laughs> Um, I honestly have uh, never contemplated, I've never thought about that. I, I think that I already have so much I'm doing now uh, as a member of parliament and ranking member on the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, member of the Appointments Committee, there's so much. For now, I'm committed to helping the Jomahama come back. Yes. I am a member of his campaign team and I believe that um, he still has a lot of good in him to offer this country. He did not accomplish all he set out to accomplish in his first term. President Akufuadu was given the opportunity. I see it as a blessing in disguise so that Ghanaians can compare both. Um, as our elders say, yeah, you taste water, you taste alcohol, and you know the difference. I, I, I will give you time to talk about the alcohol and the water when we return from uh Final commercial break. Watching face to face on CCTV. For regular news checks as they unfold, 2020 news all day, all the time. Politics, sports, entertainment, business, and more. 2020 news. We bring you the world in 20 minutes. And that's all the news in 20 minutes. Welcome back to Face to Face. And Adamo, before we went, you were talking about there was God's plan for to give Ghanaians an opportunity to weigh between Narado and John Mahama. Why are you and the people who believe in John Mahama so confident that he's the only one in the NDC who can lead the party on seat now that Adam So I believe that as a Christian, everything happens for a good reason. And that's why the Bible enjoins us that in all things, we should give thanks to God, in all things. And yes, the defeats of 2016 was painful, it was not anticipated because we thought we had done so much for the people, but you give thanks. And now Ghanaians have been able to compare. And if you listen to most Ghanaians, they complain about hardship, they complain about unfilled promises, they cannot see the one district, one factory. They cannot see the one million dollars per constituency. My constituents are still asking me, the second year, where is all you have pocketed the two million dollars? They are counting down. Now the minister says it has expired. Then there is uh, the other promises about how they will uh, manage the economy, stabilize the currency, check fuel prices. You know, you know, they've been building the fundamentals forever and we are choking and we are under excruciating hardship as they build the fundamentals. Meanwhile, what we see from their end is that they are living lavishly, the big government, 111 ministers for a country that says that look, we understand the economy is in difficult times. Um, we want you to bear with us we will see in the leadership how they respond and how they lead by example. So I would have thought, for example, that President Akufado will have had the smallest size of government in the Fourth Republic, but he rather has the biggest. I would have thought that his presidential staffers, the list they brought to parliament, almost a thousand people, the highest in our country's history. Why this fixation for big government? We in the Jamahama campaign believe that, yes, we were not perfect. We made our own mistakes as human beings, fallible as we are. We have learned from those mistakes, but we can point to better development, better stewardship in terms of achieving concrete measures for our people. Like what? Look at how we transform the education sector, which I was. For four consecutive years, we won the best Wasi nation because of the investments we made in education and the community day schools we were building all over, the retooling of the science labs, 300 of them retooled, re-equipped the 
stocking with computers and all of that. The secondary education improvement program, which we source $145 million from the World Bank for, which revamped second cycle education. It led to the results that everybody was praising in the West Africa sub-region. Look at the investments we made at the tertiary level. If you go to KNUSC, which what the MPP has to offer rather is chaos, we had constructed a petroleum chemical engineering lab. We had put up a veterinary lab for the first time, a four-story, the biggest in West Africa, and all the other achievements that you can point to. In the rural sector, look at the Kaswa interchange, look at the circle interchange, look at, look at, look at the Fofosu Solar Road. When the candidate at the time, Nana Akufuado, accused us of overpricing, the ranking member of the Rose Committee in Parliament at the time, Honorable Adiyun, said that, well, he doesn't have the evidence to support that. Now you've been in power, you said you are doing reviews. In Parliament here, we have been asking them to bring the report and let us see evidence of the overpricing and let us see the punishment. You are in control of prosecution. You appoint the Attorney General. So if there was overpricing, somebody has engaged in corrupt practices. Why is anybody working free? And remember that this is the same uh, party that even accused President Mahama of printing diaries for, was it $6 million or some outrageous figure of the sort. Even when it was, it pointed out that it is false, they will not retract it. They just move on to make the next allegation. Earlier, Nana Adodanko Akufuado had not had the chance. Now he is His Excellency Nana Adodanko Akufuado. He's had the chance. So unlike previous where he could say, try me, try me and see the difference. Now he has been tried. So he's being tried. Yes, he's being tried. But you know, as they say, I mean uh a grobe so an every anopa. Uh da be the an every fear than a jo. Um uh it's it's mid term. It's mid term a grow wave yeah. it's so clear that uh it's 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 so dry. It's like it's 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 like the state of Real Madrid now. Uh Barcelona is just having its way, you know. President John Mahama is the man to come back and take control of the of the steer. You know, every week there's a scandal. It tells us that the president is not in control. Look at the scandal at the Ghana Maritime Authority, where eight people go have lunch for more than ten thousand dollars. Even the the lost supper, you know, did not cost that much. No, you know, it, I mean, that 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 is of meetings over a period of time because You see, they've provided two explanations. That's the, that's the, that's, that's the second explanation. The first one was that it was uh, 80 and that somebody had removed the zero. So, you know, as for these people, the last time they were caught out on the cost of the audit they carried out at SNIT, which was on the PPA website, they issued a statement that, oh, it was a, a mistake, an error. You know, so, you see, and that is one of the challenges I have. They will not even subject these allegations to independent probes to build confidence. They come at themselves and just explain it away with multiple stories. I can tell you that sitting in parliament, uh, uh, having oversight over the executive, they are very, very worrying. When we return tomorrow, you will be hearing a lot more things that we will be putting out, which will blow your mind. And the president. He doesn't appear to be in control of this country. Look at the Ameri scandal. You know, you said that $510 million was overpriced. You will come and renegotiate, bring it down to $350 million. How did it become $1.2 billion? And then we are told the president was, was misled. And the former minister of energy is cooling off somewhere. We, have not, we haven't gotten to the bottom. We don't know how this occurred. What other areas... Is the president being misled on? So clearly, this president has fulfilled a childhood ambition, a childhood dream uh, to become president. Yes, let's thank God and let's commend him for becoming president. I think that uh, one term is good enough uh, for but him. If one term wasn't good for him. Uh, be, because was also say he needs another one. You see, so that's why we are comparing. Look at what Pre John Mahama did in one term. And what's look at one, them. What's one different thing mm -hmm. is John Mahama bringing? John Mahama is bringing the benefit of hindsight. I believe that this time, 
uh, John Muhammad will be more decisive. Remember that it's one of the things, even in his own book, he had talked about that he, by nature, is not that decisive, doesn't crack the whip as he should. And um, his vision for Ghana remains alive. Uh, he believes that infrastructure can transform this country. If you look at all the reports, I was reading the recent UND, UNDP report on, on poverty in northern Ghana. This, the solution they ascribed is infrastructure. Because if you open up the place, you do the roads, you provide them the water, the electricity, you know, give them decent markets and all of that, even investors will come. So I believe that his vision is the vision we need uh, for this country. And he has shown the know-how. He's clearly more dynamic and uh, he is uh, astute, some modern uh, political leader who knows how to get the job done clearly. He has to convince over a million people. Yes. Um, of these uh, things you're talking about. Absolutely. And you know, that's, that's what I love about elections. At the time, we were calling ourselves majority, majority in parliament. We didn't know we had become minority until we went for the election. It's the same way we are minority now. Who knows that we may have become majority? That is the beauty about the human being. The human being is not static. The human being assesses you every day and changes their mind. People have already made up their mind how they are going to vote in 2020. So we are not taking anything for granted. We are working hard. We've conducted our internal polls. We know where we stand. But, share. but no, <laughs> these are industrial secrets. We will not share them. But all I can tell you is that they are very positive. They give us hope. And we are going to keep working hard. As for the others who are challenging John Mahama, we welcome them. It shows, it, sh very it shows that the party is very vibrant. I worked with Professor Alabi when I was at the tertiary department. He's a fine man, um, very well managed. Um, but politics, timing is important. If it's not your time. It was in Krumah's time, not Dunquist time. You know? It was, it, was, it was Mandela's time. You know? It, yes, I mean, my senior. He did a great job as minority leader when we were last in opposition. I would always admire him for that. But once again, in politics, timing. You listen to the clarion call. You test the pulse. The weather. Honorable Kujobosu, whose time it is. Yeah, Honorable Kujobosu has done well for himself mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur, uh, as mayor in Kumasi, what he did with the Rattray Park and all of that. Impressive. You see, what I like is that it gives many people in the NDC to showcase, you know, what they have done, contributed in the past. And it tells the opponent that we have the man, so far having heard of a woman. And I believe we have the women too, even if they are not putting themselves forward now to run for president. So um, I have nothing against all of them. Fine gentlemen, Guzitano, uh, Ricketts, Sly Mensa, and, and, and all the others. But as I said, it's about timing, it's about whose season it is. The clarion call, you know, leadership must emanate from the people. And the people are crying for John Muhammad's return. And nobody can stop that wave. It's a tsunami, I can tell you. And I have predicted that John Mahama would not get anything less than 85%. Because as, as MP at the NDC Delegates Conference, because as Member of Parliament, I know the ground. And I'm not one who just sits in Parliament or sits in my office. I'm always on the ground, interacting with the people. Another time, I'm sure that some of these people will be very... Uh, fit for purpose, but at this time, it is John Mohammed's time, and we have to just allow him to complete his mission. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you yeah, for having me. It's been fantastic catching.